So, so lecture one will be about sort of general introduction to the KPC universality. Um, in lecture two, um, I'll solve the model TASAP. In lecture three, um, we'll take the scaling limit of the solution. In lecture four. So we'll get the KPZ fixed point. And lecture four will be um, the story about the KPZ fixed point, what it is. That's a bit rough. Actually, it'll, these things will all be mixed up a little bit. I'll, I'll even tell you a bit what the fixed point is today. OK. So everything I'm going to be talking about um, is a recent joint work with um, Daniel Remenek and Konstantin Matetsky. who are both here and uh, may correct me various moments. It's pretty recent. It's on the archive. Um, and it's not really in finished form. So um, I'm, we're, we invite you all to make comments. There may be uh, nicer ways to write a lot of these things. OK. So, so today I'll start by <coughs> talking about what um, Pierre talked about, but maybe a little bit slower. So, so let's start with a simple model, uh, just to give an idea of what uh, people are trying to do with this KPZ universality. So let's take the Eden model. So this is just for illustrative purposes. This is a model where it's sort of simple to see what the model is, but nobody has any results whatsoever. So. If you're like me and you get bored in these talks, you can just sit there and try to solve the Eden model. <laughs> OK, so the Eden model, it's, it's on a lattice. So you start with the, uh, it, it's two-dimensional. So these are all two-dimensional. Or, or one, it's, it's a height function, one dimension. Or height function. One D random growth. One D growth. Okay, so we start with the um, origin occupied, and then choose a neighbor at random. And now in the next step, you'll choose one of the new neighbors at random, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or maybe we could do something else. Just add add sites at rate one. So every neighboring site gets joined onto the cluster at rate one. Okay. Some neighboring sites. sites. Join the cluster. Everyone. So what you'll see after a long time is a cluster which looks like this. Approximately a ball. Maybe it's not a ball. The times t, that'll be t, because everything's joining at rate 1, right? So of approximately this shape at time t. And what we're interested in is the fluctuations of the boundary. So this, there are these universal processes which govern the, um, the boundary. So I, so I look out in this direction, or this direction, or this direction. It's the same in every direction. And you'll see fluctuations which are of size t to the 1 third. And on a scale here, on a lateral scale of size t to the two thirds. Yeah, I'll try to write bigger. <laughs> okay, so I'll just say it. So, so the cluster, it's the radius around t. Then you'll see fluctuations of size t to the one third, but on a spatial scale of t to the two thirds. And there are these universal processes, which are these processes called airy processes which govern these fluctuations. And some of them occur in random matrix theory. That's the story. 
Now, as I said, for this model, nothing is known. There's no result whatsoever. It's, it's hard to hear. How, how do you know it's in the case of the universality class? Oh, you don't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it isn't, maybe it isn't. And there's some question what exactly the KPZ universality class is. Now, one of the problems with a model like this is, of course, if you look on the boundary, uh, it's not even a function, right? It could easily do that. So I look out here, and I, wh where do I look? Right? So we restrict so far to things which are more like height functions themselves. So let's take, so now we look at height functions. R Z. Okay. So the, the most famous example, of course, is the KPZ equation itself. So the KPZ equation Is that big enough to see, Ivan? OK. So the KPZ equation is dth. So this is for an evolving height function on R. So it's h, t, and x. So x, x here is in R, and t is greater than 0, greater than 0. And it's supposed to be evolving according to the following not very well posed stochastic PDE. OK, so let me explain what all these things are. OK, so this, this is just the heat equation. This here, so, so this is a smoothing mechanism. This is supposed to be a space-time white noise, which says that this thing's being randomly perturbed at different positions at different times independently. The interesting term, the most interesting term, is this one. This is a lateral growth mechanism. It's the nonlinearity. And that's the thing we're going to be looking at. So what is lateral growth? The idea is that when you should think of its sort of surface, there. And you should think of the surface as growing randomly, but outwards. So the growth is actually in all directions at once, just like the Eden model. Think of particles coming down from the side and sticking to this thing. Okay? And of course, if this thing goes outwards there, then the actual growth is, um, okay, let's do it there. The actual growth is um, the vertical growth is proportional to the square root of 1 plus dxh squared, right? So it's a nonlinear function of the, of the slope. That's the key thing. It could be any function. I mean, in the picture I drew it, it's going to be 1 plus dxh squared. But anyway, you've got some function f of dxh, which it's reasonable to suppose is symmetric. So f of dxh is f of minus dxh, because why should it grow more that way or that way? Not much else. But OK, there's some magic in which if you try to write this equation, if you try to smooth out the noise and take a limit, no matter what function you start with, you get this equation. OK, so that's some sort of basic equation. OK, so that's kpc. Um, now, the model we'll be talking about a lot is called TASEP. So TASEP is a very special discretization of the KPZ equation. Okay. So now the height function, instead of just being a real function, on Z. So here we have H, T, and X, and here that's in Z. The height function will just look like a bunch of 
you can't draw it as if it's a function of r, because otherwise it's hard to draw. So all you ever do is go up or down by one. That's the rule. So the height function is a random walk path. It just means it goes up or down by one at each time. Does that make, is that fair enough? OK. So that's the, that's the h at some particular time. And the dynamics is just very, very simple. If you've got an up, then it jumps to a down at rate one. That's all that happens. And that happens independently for every one of the ups. So for every little peak, it jumps down to a lower thing. Okay. That's the full dynamics, and that's taste up. It's amazing that such a simple model could actually have all the structure of all these things, but that is actually a discretization of KPZ. You can see that, because what's happening here is that the, the jump rate is just minus, so you can write DTH equals minus 2 at x, indicator function of one of those guys at x, right? dp. This is the whole dynamics. When there's an up guy, there's a Poisson process, which makes you go down. And when you go down, you do minus 2. That's it. But this guy here is just exactly equal to, I did this calculation on the plane, a half grad minus h grad plus one plus plus. Where that's the backwards derivative, discrete derivative, that's the forward discrete derivative, and that's the discrete Laplace. Okay, so for example, the grad minus I won't write them all because you guys know what I mean, I think. Okay. So, so TASEP you could just think of as a very, very special discretization of KPZ. Okay. Now, there's lots of other models in the class. For example, it doesn't have to be height, randomly growing height functions in the normal sense. For example, if you do this hopf kohl transformation, so hopf kohl Pierre already said this. hopf kohl just means to take uh, h equals log z and write an equation for z. If you look at the KPZ equation, you write an equation for uh, e to the h, you can just write it. You have to assume that C is nicer than space-time white noise. So let's just assume C is nice. Then you get the following equation. You get so in a sense, it's linearized by this transformation. In fact, KPZ doesn't make good sense. Because, um, well, OK, let me, let me go back for a second. One of the key things about KPZ and TASEP is that you know the invariant measure. Okay. So it turns out if you start TASEP with a simple random walk, i.e. you flip a coin at each time to determine whether you're going up or whether you're going down. So that's called the random walk, of course. The coin could be biased, but in our discussion, let's just assume it's a fair coin. So start with a fair coin, so you've got a random walk path. Then it turns out that this dynamics actually preserves the random walk. So you get that later, so that's uh, invariant. Well, it's not exactly invariant. You can see that something's going on. It's going down. 
So up to height shifts, it's invariant. Here too, Brownian motion is invariant modular height shifts. Okay. So if you start with a Brownian motion, what you'll see later is a Brownian motion shifted. Now, if you haven't seen this before, you should be very, very surprised that you're allowed to start with Brownian motion at all, because you've got this dxh squared term. And that's the problem with KPZ. So KPZ is really ill-posed, because the h's, for any positive time, locally look like a Brownian motion, with local variance 2, in this case. That was the root 2 that Pierre saw. And so this dxh squared term is obviously illegal, you're not allowed to differentiate Brownian motion. You're certainly not allowed to square what you get. Um, so really, there's a minus infinity hiding in here. Okay. And that minus infinity is the thing that renormalizes that term. On the other hand, this equation is actually in good shape. It's one of the few stochastic PDEs you can actually make sense of. So you can start with space-time white noise, make sense of Z. And the answer is a nice continuous function. It turns out to be never equal to zero as long as you start with something non-zero non in some interval, something positive. Z should be positive here. So then you can take log of it. And that log, you could just decree to be the solution of the KPZ equation. OK? So that, there's a way out of this thing. You can just, that's called the hopf cole solution of KPZ. Just means start with that, solve it. You can solve it yourself, and take the log, and then that's the solution of KPZ. And uh, of course, Martin Heyer has a very elaborate theory of KPZ, which in the end proves that his solution is the hoff cole solution. Okay. And of course, when he makes sense of this equation, there's definitely a minus infinity hiding there. That term has to be renormalized. All right. Okay. Now, the hopf cole thing means that, again, if you took a smooth C, you could rewrite using the Feynman-Katz formula. It says that the Z would be the expectation over Brownian motion path starting at x of e to the integral 0 to t of C s ds. Yes, and then uh, Z 0. Okay, so that's the Feynman-Katz formula for the solution of that, if, if C was nice enough, a nice enough function for it to work. Now, it turns out it actually works in this case, though this has to be slightly interpreted slightly differently, but that's, that's okay. The main thing is, even if you have, you, you could think of C being slightly regularized, and what you would have is a free energy of paths which are Brownian motion paths weighted by how much of this background C they get. Okay? And that's called a directed polymer. Random environment. So just to say it again, suppose that C is slightly nicer than this. You could take a lattice version of all this, for example. You freeze the C. And then you look at Brownian motion paths weighted by this weight, e to the integrals of c. Okay? The z is the partition function for that model. And the log of z, which is kpz, or some sort of discrete version of kpz, is the free energy of that model. In other words, the conclusion is, is that we're not only talking about random growth, but things like free energies of directed polymers. So let's start.
And there's lots of other models. For example, if you took u equals dxh, it satisfies a noisy Burgers equation. Okay. You could just write it down. It's easy to write down the equation. It should satisfy. And you can think it's, so you can think of these things as random fluids also. So there's a lot of different interpretations of these models. Okay. Okay, now let's, let's get to where we want to get to. Okay. So scaling. So one of the nice things about KPZ versus TASEP, for example, or maybe one of the other models, you can make all sorts of random growth models, but KPZ has a little advantage over it, which is that rescaling this equation is fairly convenient. It's hard to rescale this guy, but we know how to rescale this guy. So we want to look on big scales. So let's take H epsilon TX is epsilon to the 1 half H of epsilon to the minus z t epsilon to the minus 1 x. OK, so why did I do that? Because um, let's just look on big scales of x, and I'll just call that epsilon minus 1. So epsilon minus 1 is just the big scale you're looking at in space. Then I'm looking for a time scale in time, which will work. And I'm forced to take epsilon 1 half. That's because at t equals 0, if I took the invariant measure, it would only rescale like this. So there's no choice but to do that. And so we're just looking for a z. What's the z that's going to get us something interesting? Now, KPZ itself is not scaling invariant. Um, when you do this, you're going to get the need to put on your glasses, <laughs> or I'll get it wrong. OK. <laughs> dth epsilon equals, so this is how the different things scale, um, 3 halves minus z dx epsilon squared plus epsilon to the 2 minus z dx squared h epsilon plus 2 minus c. The, the c isn't exactly the same c as you started with. It's a, it's a rescaled c. OK. Now, the point here is that different things in the equation scale differently. It's not a scaling invariant equation. Now, you might think that the, these two things scale differently, but that's just this is kind of a cheat. If you remember stochastic calculus, Brownian motion is supposed to scale like the square root of the other guy. So this is actually, these guys are scaling together, and this guy's scaling together. Well, together. <laughs> this guy's scaling differently, I mean. OK. Now you can also see that um, unless you take z equals 3 halves, you're in trouble if epsilon is going to 0. Right? So for large scales, for large scales, z equals 3 halves. So that, that's the important thing. That's the dynamic scaling exponent, which is exactly the same thing, if you think about it for a second, as saying that at time t, you have t to the 1 third and t to the 2 thirds. Okay? These are exactly the same thing, because that's saying that the height scales as one-third of the time, and the space scales as two-thirds of the time. It's exactly the same thing. That's called the one, two, three scaling. Okay? These guys are different. These guys dominate on small scales. So if, if you were sending epsilon to infinity, then you would have to take z equals 2 z equals 2. And this term dominates, the linear term dominates. So it tells you on small scales, the thing is going to look like this, which is 
that thing, that equation, if you just drop this, sends you to a Brownian motion with variance 2. You can just check. So that's why on very small scales, this thing immediately looks like a Brownian motion with variance 2. And on large scales, it's dominated by that, and that's the big question. Okay? And that's where all these area processes come in. Okay. Okay. But the main thing to see is that this KPZ equation itself is not scaling invariant. It's going to something else under these scalings. Under the z equals 3 half scaling, this thing's trying to drop out, and you're dominated by that. Okay. All right. So let me be a little bit more precise about this now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain exactly what you see here in special cases in the context of TASEP. Okay. So I take the TASEP height function. This is just to remind you that we're talking about the TASEP height function as opposed to the um, KPZ height function. And I'm going to look at these scales, epsilon to minus 3 halves t and epsilon to the minus 1t. And all these models have all sorts of finicky numbers which you have to get straight so that everything matches previous results. And here it's a 2. Here it's a 2. There's a huge constant you have to subtract because on these time scales, this thing's gone down a long way. <laughs> okay. And epsilon one half front. Okay. Okay, so let's look at that thing. So that's the rescaled height function of TASEP after a very, very long time. And what, let's just look at this thing at time t equals one. It, it doesn't actually matter because uh, time's being rescaled, so t equals one is as good as anything else. Okay? Okay, so the, the following thing is well known, and hopefully after three lectures you'll understand why it was well known, but I'm not going to go through the derivation now. You want it? Yeah, thanks. That's an x. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Everything else good? OK. So you take a limit of this thing, and the following, so this epsilon goes to 0. And um, it known, was known how to calculate a couple of cases. So this, this depends on the initial data. And one starts with the initial data and then derives some very exact formula, rescales the exact formula. So here's one initial data. One initial data. So this is the one Pierre talked about and called it, I don't know, what's it called? We call it narrow wedge. So if you take the limit there, you get something called the ARI2 process minus a parabola. Or you could think maybe to start with this. Going on forever in both directions, we'll call that flat. Because asymptotically it looks flat. And you get something else. There you one process. This is a process which, if you haven't seen in the courses yet, have they? No, OK. Well, I'll describe it in lots of detail later. Um, but for example, for each x, this guy here uh, is a GUE distri distributed course according to the Tracy Whittem 
GUE distribution. So um, the marginals are F GUE. That's the rescaled top eigenvalue of a GUE random matrix. The area one process, the marginals. Oh, okay. The area, this process actually arises if you take the Dyson Brownian motion for the GUE and you look at the top eigenvalue, it actually converges to this. And you would think the same might be true here, but it's not. The area one process is not what you get if you take the Dyson Brownian motion for the GOE. So there's some link with random matrices, but the link is not complete. It's more like a bunch of coincidences. All right. I want to write the formulas for these guys. <laughs> but on the other hand, if I write the formulas for those guys, I'll just keep writing forever. So I'm going to write a formula for a third one. <laughs> this guy has both in it, as we'll see. So this means, um, this means all particles to the left of the, oh, we didn't say, it. so it's going down to the left of the origin and then like that, okay? This, this is zero, okay. Good. Then you get a crossover process called ARI uh, two to one of X, okay? It's a process which looks like the ARI two process way over there and looks like the ARI one process way over here. So it sort of encapsulates both, which means I only have to write one formula. So I will write the formula for it. Okay, so the formulas look like this. So this is just will give you an idea what the formula looks like. Don't take it terribly seriously right now. The probability that this very two to one process, this is just the name of the process, and this is a bunch of different positions. So you, you ask what are the um, endpoint marginals of this process called area two to one, and they're given by Fredholm determinants. Okay. One thing I think people can see is ne usually processes we think is parameterized by time, but time here is called X, and it lives in R. So you just have to get used to that. Okay. So this is a Fredholm determinant. Uh, maybe go into later what that is, of 